Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm Logan, and lately we've been recommending a lot of different ways that you can get started with a home server without spending a whole lot of money. And one of the best ways we think you can go about this is by using older secondhand components, because usually you'll see much better performance per dollar compared to the latest and greatest options. But this raises a few interesting questions that you guys have actually given us in our previous videos on the subject, and I wanted to address some of these concerns, especially the ones related to performance and power consumption, because for some of you, depending on wherever in the world you live and what you want to do with your server, it might not actually make as much sense to get older hardware. So in this video, we're going to be putting that to the test, comparing different platforms using DDR3, DDR4, and DDR5 memory as a very rough and not so scientific baseline to figure out what the oldest hardware is that you should actually be considering, how much power it consumes compared to the newer solutions, and whether or not that price to performance ratio actually scales over time. So with all that said, let's take a quick look at our test subjects, and I wanted to cover a broader range of hardware, starting from the oldest here, I decided to throw in this AMD A10-7860K APU system with 8GB of DDR3 RAM and a MSI Micro ATX motherboard. The biggest draw here is that these old A10 CPUs aren't very desirable now nowadays and thus can be had for very cheap. But it represents the very lowest end that I would even consider for server use, anything older is just too slow. And it's also a little nostalgic as we got the CPU from one of the first videos my dad and I ever made on this channel about 8 years ago now. Next up is a very respectable mini ITX motherboard here featuring the Intel Core i5-4460 and 16GB of DDR3 memory. This Haswell board and CPU are about 10 years old now, but this is actually a pretty similar setup to the Lenovo Mini PC that I showed off in our last video, so I already know that performance is going to be decent, but we'll have to see how it holds up in terms of power efficiency. Next up is this Skylake Core i5-6500 and 16GB of DDR4 in an older MSI gaming motherboard. Overall, it's pretty comparable to the Intel DDR3 platform, but DDR4 setups can go for a little more money, so we'll have to see if there's any kind of extra performance to be had, or if we can do the same thing with less power draw, maybe. And finally, representing our very modern DDR5 system is going to be something a little different. I'm actually going to be using this mini PC provided to us for review by GMK Tech. This is their K8 model with a Ryzen 7 8845HS and 32GB of DDR5 memory. It has dual 2.5GB Ethernet and a pair of 2280 M.2 slots, which could make for a really nice home for a pair of 4TB drives in a mirrored RAID configuration for a super fast all solid state NAS. Other than that, the case is all plastic. It really feels a lot cheaper than it should for the price, but it gets the job done. So I know this is a bit of a spoiler, but believe it or not, this brand new DDR5 system absolutely destroys the others to the extent of their CPU and GPU performance. This thing is actually a really capable little gaming box. But I'm trying to make a video about the data I collected for a real world use, rather than the marketing points the manufacturer wanted me to talk about, so that's not actually what we're looking at today. So let's get into my testing methodology here and put these systems through some tests to try to determine whether or not it's worth it to get older hardware. On all three of these systems, I'm going to be running Debian Linux and testing the reported power consumption at the wall using a watt meter while doing various tasks like video streaming transcoding and running various Docker containers in an idle state. I'm also going to be running some repeatable benchmarks to determine the full extent of the capabilities of each system and how that could translate into the yearly operating costs for each one. And with all that, here's the table of all the data that I collected across these four systems, but on its own it isn't saying much, so let me break it down row by row, and we'll see how these compare. The first thing I found which was quite predictable was the fact that the idle power consumption, while running absolutely nothing on the system other than the OS itself, scaled accordingly with the age of each machine. So the modern Ryzen platform was the lowest at 11 watts average, the Skylake platform idled at 15, Haswell at 22 watts, and our poor little A10-7860K did its best drawing 35 watts just sitting there doing absolutely nothing, so if the margins here are indicative of what's to come, you can probably skip the AMD A10 in your server. The first actual benchmark I ran was using the LZMA compression and decompression tests offered by 7-Zip on Linux, and while these tests don't use a lot of the features on these CPUs, it's still a way to get a reproducible score relating to integer math and DRAM access speeds on these platforms, and most importantly, power consumption. This one was pretty neat, as expected, the A10 here was the worst performer, pulling 92 watts during the test and coming up with a score of 11,512 MIPS, or million operations per second. And the most important thing about this result is that it's the very worst one I recorded. The Haswell and Skylake platforms both managed very similar scores, of just above 14,000 MIPS, but the Skylake system was only pulling about 49 watts over the duration of the test, compared to the 63 watts of the older Intel platform. 
and as you might expect, our little Ryzen 8845HS here absolutely destroyed the others with the second highest power consumption, but also scoring 73,000 MIPS, about 5.2 times higher than the older platforms. Next up with our testing here is a quick real world look at the idle power consumption of these servers with some software running in the background. As I mentioned, all of these systems are running Debian Linux, and I went ahead and installed Casa OS, as well as Docker containers for Home Assistant, Minecraft, and Jellyfin servers, since I feel like this represents more of a realistic idle state for a home server. And here what I found really fascinating was the fact that as you go to the newer platforms, the margin between the fresh idle power consumption with nothing at all running, and the server idle power consumption actually closes substantially. The A10 drew 54 watts here, 19 watts more than its pure idle state, while the Haswell i5 drew 28 watts, about 6 watts more, and the Skylake i5 didn't really show any difference, neither did the Ryzen system at 17 watts and 16 watts respectively. Next up was transcoding, and for this I loaded a 24 minute 4K H.265 MP4 file onto my Jellyfin server and tried playing that back in a web browser, so the server was transcoding that file into a 1080p 60 megabit H.264 stream. Software encoding is obviously very demanding, so here we could see the full extent of the power consumption we'd expect from each platform. I took notes of the playback quality from each system as well, and just to give you an idea, our AMD A10 system drew 107 watts from the wall during this test, and the stream was just stuttering horribly the entire time. It was completely unwatchable on this hardware. Meanwhile, the i5-4440 pulled 70 watts and almost produced a stable stream, but was just too prone to hitching and freezing if you ever skipped around in the video. You had to give it a while to start the transcode and get a few minutes in before it would stop hitching up. Meanwhile, the Skylake i5 only drew 55 watts during the transcode and made a perfectly smooth stream. And obviously the modern Ryzen CPU made a super smooth stream as well, but it was drawing 77 watts during playback, which is actually higher than even our Haswell system. So does this mean that the brand new Ryzen chip is somehow less efficient than even our 10 year old processor? Is there even a point to buying one of these? Well, obviously, yeah, the Ryzen chip is way more efficient, and what you need to consider here is that the CPU is going to try and get as much work done as quickly as it possibly can. Drawing more power at any given moment in time isn't a bad thing if you're actually trying to get more work done, and that's exactly what's going on here. By default, Jellyfin is configured to transcode an entire file ahead of time, meaning it'll sit with your CPU at full blast and transcode the entire video you're watching at the settings you requested. To get a feel for the effect of this in the real world, I set up another controlled test using FFmpeg with the exact same transcoding settings on the same file as Jellyfin was using, and manually transcoded the video on each system, and recorded how long it took. The average power draw across all of these tests was identical, obviously, but now we can see that the AMD A10 was drawing its 107 watts for a total of 20 minutes and 16 seconds in order to convert our 24 minute file. The Haswell system completed the same task in 13 minutes and 24 seconds, the Skylix system in 11 minutes and 44 seconds, and the Ryzen got this done in just 3 minutes and 13 seconds. So if we consider how long the system was running for each encode and factor in the average power consumption, we can actually see how many watt hours were consumed to get this work done. Of course, watt hours are the actual unit that you see on your power bill, or probably kilowatt hours, so you can kind of use this as a rough guideline to multiply and figure out how many shows you might watch in a week across a whole year. And then by that, you can see how much each one of these systems would cost. The A10 drew 36.14 watt hours to do the encode. The Haswell system drew 15.63 watt hours. The Skylake system drew 10.75 watt hours. And finally, the Ryzen system, despite being the second highest power draw, got the work done with only 4.13 watt hours since it completed so quickly and only drew that high wattage for a very brief period. So it's obvious by looking at this that the Ryzen system is going to come with some very tangible benefits. It's a lot faster and draws significantly less power with demanding workloads. But that also raises another really fascinating point that if you don't have these kinds of demanding workloads, is there actually a point in spending so much more money on a brand new system? Our Skylake platform here held very similar idle power consumption, and just as a quick test, I also tried to direct play my media using the Jellyfin Media Player app on my PC, meaning the server didn't have to do any transcoding, and all but the A10 system actually showed the exact same power draw during playback as they did at idle. So with this in mind, if you always use a client that supports direct playback of your media on your server, you're actually going to get better video quality and less power consumption. So the extra hundreds of dollars you could spend on a brand new system doesn't actually get put to any good use here. 
After seeing what kinds of numbers we got here today, I would definitely avoid something like the AMD A10 system for a home server. These things just run way too hot and they don't get anything done. And honestly, for the price difference between the Intel DDR3 and DDR4 platforms, I don't think I can recommend anything older than a DDR4 platform nowadays, considering how much better the idle power consumption is. Skylake is one of the oldest platforms with DDR4 support that you're going to run into these days, and these CPUs still definitely have a lot of life left in them. Not to mention that there are tons of options out there for mini PCs, you usually get M.2 slots for NVMe storage, and RAM isn't that expensive, so I really feel like this is where you need to start looking if you're gonna try and get into an entry level home server right now. But I understand as well that my tests are far from perfect and I am an extremely fallible person that probably made some mistakes. So if there are any ways I can improve my testing methodology or if I should just do this all again with more hardware, then please let me know down in the comments below. I wanna do my best to deliver useful information with these things, so tell me what I can do better going forward. And with that, I think it's time to wrap up this video, so I hope you found it helpful, and let us know if you're considering investing in some new hardware for a home server, and what you ultimately end up going with. Let us know if you have any questions or comments down in the comment section below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss any of our future content, and as always, have an awesome day.